You're listening to The Streaming Wars, the podcast that discusses all of the latest happenings regarding your favorite streaming services. Find out which service is winning the war this time around. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of The Streaming Wars. I'm Dustin and Tony is with me, and we're here to discuss everything from September 16th through the 22nd. There's a little bit of news, but there's a bunch of different discussion points. We've got some new numbers, courtesy of the Entertainment Strategy Guy, who has some numbers that he's put together for Mulan on Disney+. Plus. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about a new report that uh, popped up just last night from the time we're recording this, that Quibi could be potentially exploring a sale. Yeah, we'll get into that. Uh, I promise you we will. And then uh, the other big news coming out of the last week is that NBC Universal has gotten Peacock onto Roku after a couple of months. And there's some reasons that I believe that has taken place. So we're going to get into that. And then finally, we're going to round out the episode talking about some Emmys because I think the Emmy nominations were a big talk of the town about how many Emmy nominations Netflix earned. But of course, the awards themselves, the actual award winning is different than the nominations and we're going to see who walked away with the most number of Emmys. So with that being said, let's get into the news, starting off with Netflix. Netflix has landed a comedy feature called It's Wednesday Night, which is described as a mix between Bridesmaids and Game Night that is coming sometime in the future. Jumping over to Prime Video, there is a Broadway adaption of What the Constitution Means to Me, which is a film adaption that is getting a Prime Video debut, as the playwright behind that is actually signed an exclusive deal as well. We have nothing for Hulu. Paramount Plus, there is a serial killer podcast called Happy Face that is currently being adapted at CBS All Access slash the future Paramount Plus. Uh, I don't know about you, but this sh- this opportunity, um, this show sounds pretty awesome. Um, I-, I love, I-, I think think true crime has got like a very interesting and special place. And, you know, in the podcast realm, true crime has really flourished as a as a great, you know, subject matter in, in the podcast storytelling process. And just reading this article and just seeing what this podcast was about, about how you know, this this woman's father was a notorious serial killer and having her deal with it and him calling her after all these years and confessing to new crimes is just, that's pretty crazy. So I could see that this type of a show would, would have a huge following and really get going. I think this is like a really good content piece for Paramount Plus as they move forward to have like a, a really good true crime centered um, piece of content this is, this is really really interesting yeah i definitely agree i am i love true crime stuff and this this is compelling because it's from a different perspective it's not just you watching a serial killer take you know do their murders and then the law enforcement trying to catch them or whatever it's a completely different take on it i think that's what makes this truly unique i mean it sounds so fiction like in terms of like oh yeah this this guy's daughter he like he calls his daughter and confesses more crimes and stuff and the, this wild chase that happens this wild search for you know new new victims and stuff like that it sounds so crazy but it's real and i think that's the compelling part it's like how fictional the story sounds but it, it is it is so true and just having the killer's daughter as a central point i think it could be very compelling and can really show just how hard it might be that you're living under the shadow of your parents even as an adult and the the past actions that they committed how do you bear those Anyway, I think, it, I think it'd be really special. All right. So then jumping over to Apple TV Plus, Apple TV Plus has announced two new series, one called Doug Unplugs and another one called Stillwater. These series will be debuting in November and December, along with the return of Ghost Rider. Then jumping over to Disney Plus, Disney Plus is developing a movie about inner, an inner city youth orchestra. And then there also it was announced that Google has now made Disney Plus able to be activated with Google voice control through the hub devices that Google offers. So you could sit there and say, hey, Google, you can then play for audience. Uh, 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 his, uh, yeah. He said it and it turned on. So uh, Google is listening. Yeah, it turned and... on a thousand device. Crap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So, yeah. So let me rephrase that and say, hey, G, play The Mandalorian on Disney Plus and it will actually play it right there on your Google hub screen if you have them. Also, this marks the second streaming service that that is able to be done outside of YouTube because Netflix had this exact same option activated, I believe, earlier in the summer in June, and now Disney Plus is the second one to get it. You do, however, just so you know, in order to access this, if you do have smart devices, and I'm guessing a lot of our audience 
does. In order to access it, you do have to go into the Google Home app and actually link your Disney Plus account to your Google account in order for it to be able to access it, to be able to play it. There's no touch abilities. You can't like scroll through and search for content using the screen itself, but you can ask it to play the latest episode of a show from Disney Plus. So that is a new feature that that is rolling out as we speak. Should be available as the next you get the next group of updates on your Google devices. And that also applies to the devices outside of the normal Google Nest branded devices as well. That also will include JBL and the Novo screens as well. All right, now we get to Quibi. First off, there's a docuseries focusing on women creating change called All Her with Angela Rye, which is coming to Quibi. And then the next bit of news is probably the one that you probably weren't expecting, at least now. But according to the Wall Street Journal, as reported on Monday, September 21st, Quibi is exploring strategic options, including the potential sale as it struggles to break through the competitive streaming landscape. Huh. That is, that is quite a surprise. I would have never pictured Quibi being in a position where they would be trying to get out of the game. So we, we've we talked about this before. What is the future of Quibi? Because if it doesn't take off and it doesn't seem like it has been taking off, I mean, they've had some shows that have had some success. And to be fair, they actually did win a couple of Emmys, which we'll talk about later on. But the big thing here is what is there to even buy at Quibi? Because honestly... They're, they don't have any rights to any of the shows that are airing on Quibi. The production companies that are developing them and producing them, they're the ones who still own the rights. So in other words, a show that you know garnered a second season on Quibi, Punked, is going to get a second season, but those show rights are owned by the original creators of the show, which would be MTV slash Viacom CBS because they're all part of that same corporate umbrella. There's other shows on there too. Even the movies themselves are not being are not owned by it. So Free Ray Sean or the most dangerous game. These aren't even owned by Quibi. Quibi has none of their content. They have no library to go, you know, to get absorbed into another service. Nothing. All they have is the potential technology and the potential ad sales that they have lined up for the future of the the company. I can't see a situation where they're going to get a lot of money. There's the report said that they have about $200 million on hand, but they're looking at potential options of either raising additional cash or merging uh, with an acquisition company so that they could specifically position themselves in a better spot. Personally, I think it's a crapshoot and Quibi is going to be gone in a year because this seems like it's just another footnote in the short history of Quibi. I, I agree and I apologize to listeners. There's a uh, there's somebody power washing my apartment so uh, the outside of it, so um, sorry about that. I, I think a, p- a potential acquisition is, is pretty interesting. Um, I feel that Quibi's position uh, to be you know taken over be bought to be sold however you want to say it is a lot higher now that they they had that lawsuit that was dismissed against the company echo about the the turn cell technology since that they had that you know lawsuit dismissed their position on you know this unique technology is a lot stronger than before so that's definitely that could be pretty compelling for you know a, a certain type of you know media company I, I think you bring up a good point that you know it could be since they don't own the rights to any of their content it's going to be a harder sell that they are a tech company that serves videos so that's what they do in a very unique way and i don't you know like they might have like some type of data user data on like that that could help advertisers in some way but i, I feel like if you know if, if this is the direction that they're going to go is to put themselves in a position to be acquired by somebody it would have to be like somebody i could see facebook honestly or, or google getting in the game there and yes quibi as a service might lose money but taking over that technology of the turnstile it's very easy to go from landscape to mobile very quickly and they found a very seamless transition for that i feel like they could i feel like facebook could incorporate something like that into instagram i feel like google could take on um some of that functionality and turn youtube to be so that youtube on mobile can be a better experience than what it is because currently youtube on mobile is really just like a bigger i mean a smaller version of the desktop site and there's nothing really like a true mobile experience there so i could see like you know this technology being transferred to like instagram or to or to youtube i mean another competitor that's kind of out there that we haven't talked about that probably could is also snapchat as well but as, as we're talking about these players it's it's you know, Quibi is not, I don't see like a big, I don't see them like a really big jump moving forward. I see them becoming a niche player in the space and kind of going away. I mean, they are a niche player, but even more so. And, you know, the legend of Quibi as a content producer is just going to go away. It's really just going to be, you know, dev shop and owning those IP, owning that, owning those patents to the turnstile is really going to be the most important thing about Quibi. 
overall. Let's just put it this way. It's not going to be a great future for Quibi one way or the other. They might be ordering new shows, but the thing is, and I've said, I've stated this before, but when it comes to Quibi, everyone keeps talking about, oh, you know, they raised an insane amount of money. $1.7 billion is what they ended up totally raising before they even launched. And the thing is, that's an amazing number. But the one thing that's very important to make sure to note about that is that a lot of that money was coming from the exact same companies who were then selling shows to Quibi. So they put money into Quibi. Quibi then takes the money and sells and purchases a show from those some of those same production companies. And it's almost like they're getting their money back, but for, for production. And if it doesn't do well, well, they're still getting paid for the production, which is a job thing by itself. But then the other part of it is, you know, they can write it off if Quibi goes under because they're just an investor. They can take an investing loss. While that's not ideal, that is what, you know, that is how it could work if Quibi ends up going under. I don't see any way where Quibi emerges. I've talked about this multiple times before. I don't see a situation where Quibi emerges because the thing is, we're not even a year from their launch date. They had almost $2 billion to begin with. They obviously had some, they, they probably have more money that they have lined up to at least get if they if they continue on into 2021 because of the ad buys that they have for the service. So they have, they'd be bringing in some more money. The problem is that unless someone's going to come in and pump even more money into the service, for what purpose, I do not know because... There's, you know, they're not seeing any growth. It doesn't matter what shows they're producing. The growth just isn't happening. We haven't even heard anything as far as numbers since I think June. And that was back when they said, oh, it was all because of COVID. That's why we're at where we're at. And I mean, and, and to be fair, yes, COVID has had an effect on a lot of different avenues of, of entertainment and media and things like that. But the one thing that every, everybody is quick to point out, especially tech journalists, is that Snapchat and TikTok, they actually boomed during the pandemic. While Quibi, who's producing content in a similar vein, not necessarily the same content or you know similar content, in the same in the same vein as you know short form content, they, they were booming while Quibi was you know struggling to really get, even get noticed in, in a lot of situations. So I think it's just important important to notice that COVID, yes, had its impact, but did not, was not the reason why Quibi ultimately is failing. All right. So then moving into HBO Max, there is a period comedy series called Our Flag Means Death that has gotten a series order. AT&T has confirmed an ad-supported tier of HBO Max for early 2021. HBO Max has acquired Mo Williams' Storytime Shorts. They already had an exclusive deal, but they have actually gone back and gotten his previous content that he previously created to that exclusive deal. And then HBO Max has greenlit the docuseries Not So Pretty from the exact same filmmakers as On the Record, which if you remember correctly that film was originally meant to pr- premiere on apple tv plus oprah was attached to it as an executive producer there was something that happened the film ended up getting pulled from apple tv plus oprah distanced herself from it and then this and then hbo max ended up picking up this the the film and bringing it over to the service and now they're going to be doing a four-part series on hbo max diving into the beauty industry all right going over to peacock this is where we get some another interesting thing to development so let's so basically the headline here is that peacock is on roku but the real question is how did this happen it's very how interesting did this happen so quickly yeah. because i'm um, just checking it out i mean one day i got uh, a weekly email dump from uh, no a daily email dump from streamable uh, the streamable.com I, I think that's what it is and it talks about like this roku deal then the next day oh that they're done and i mean i texted you and you're like oh yeah this all happened within 24 hours so it's a pretty crazy situation given in contrast of like HBO Max and and, and their disagreement with Roku and Amazon Fire. Basically last Thursday late in the day there was an uh, there was a rumor floating around that NBC Universal was going to be was going to be pulling all of their apps, their TV anywhere apps from Roku unless Roku let Peacock onto the service. For those of you who are wondering well what what does NBC Universal have? Well they have a lot. I mean they have not only their news channels, their sports channels, they also have NBC proper, they have Bravo, they have E, they have a lot of individual apps because they own a lot of different channels. They have USA, they have Sci-Fi, all of these channels that are on cable and broadcast, they have individual apps that you have access to if you are a cable provider that you can access if you have Roku. It makes up a pretty good chunk of, of channels. I mean, there's a good collection of them. That being said, it was, it was kind of like, huh, 
Well, that's one way to get Roku to kind of like move towards getting Peacock on. That was the first headline. Then I think it was Friday morning, there was word that came out that said that there was a deal in place for Peacock to land on the service, but it completely fell through. And now all the any, Anywhere apps from NBC Universal are coming off the service within the next two weeks, which was a surprise because you would think that there'd be deals in place where they can't just take them off. But, you know, because everybody always talks about how like, oh, well, Prime Video signed a new deal with CBS All Access to keep the service on for multiple years. You know, it, it doesn't just come up coincidentally that all of them are up at the same exact time because CBS All Access is its own thing. While Paramount or Viacom CBS, it is, has a lot of different. Also, they have their own CBS Anywhere app. They have other channels like the Paramount Network. They have MTV. They have Nickelodeon. They have other channels that exist within, you know, broadcast and cable that have their own anywhere apps too. But you don't hear about them being linked at the same time. So then by Friday, Friday ad evening, it was announced that, that there was a deal in place, but nobody had officially said anything. And I believe it was like Saturday morning. I woke up and I saw on Twitter, there was a, there was a comment from Peacock stating that they were so happy that Roku was joining the flock, playing off of their, their bird analogies that they've used so many times during the marketing of, of Peacock. But they said that, and then Roku had an official comment that said that within the coming, within the the next couple weeks, Roku were going to be adding Peacock to the service. And then what was even crazier was by Monday, Peacock was already on Roku. It was it was already available. And as we're talking now, Peacock is available on Roku devices all over the place. So within a matter of days, this all took place. And seemingly, it seems as if the defining was NBC Universal potentially pulling their other, ser- their other streaming apps from Roku and that being a problem. Also, there's word on the street that that there's specific NBC Universal content that will be licensed so that Roku can use it on their individual Roku channel, which is not a surprise because that's also what we've heard about Disney Plus with Amazon and how IMDb TV got certain shows that were part of ABC Studios within the corporate umbrella of, of Disney that ended up at IMDb TV that are licensed by Amazon that could have potentially greased the wheels for the deal that uh, potentially needed to happen with Disney Plus and Amazon because Amazon and Disney Plus weren't there at the very, you know, from the very beginning either with a deal. And then suddenly that was something that happened. So let's talk about that first. And then we'll talk about the ramifications for the future of what this means for HBO Max. This whole situation was pretty crazy. It's so hard to compare different contract negotiations because each side has different, you know, end goals, you know, each, each deal is different, but there is a lot of correlation there between, you know, an ad support business and whatnot, um, between, you know, HBO Max and, you know, the NBC Peacock, um, parts the platform. I think having an app, um, an app already on the platform and it probably had a, a decent amount of, tra- of, of traffic on through it probably helped grease the wheels a bit because there's something, you know, Roku doesn't want the bad press of like, oh yeah, hey, this, you know, this, the streaming partner is now not on our platform anymore due to contract negotiation. Like that in a PR setting will look like it's just Roku's fault already for them not coming together sooner versus like HBO Max. HBO Max was never on the platform to begin with. And, you know, there's, there's that distinction of like, well, we're not ready to for them to be on here until the deal is ready versus like, you know, a renegotiation where Roku might just seem like they're being, um, you know, money hungry or uh, some other type of adjective you want to describe them for not re, re-upping the deal. Uh, I think being on there before definitely helped the advantage. And I think that, you know, Peacock has come out and I think that, that they want their ads to be of at most five minutes. I think coming out with some specifications of how they're doing their ads before and really pushed Roku into a corner of like, okay, well, given the set of constraints, like there's no room for negotiation. Like they already promised their customers and the customers are already paying or will be paying or will be watching. And they're really kind of stuck in a boat of like, hey, this is the best that we're going to do. There's no better negotiations there. Or HBO Max has said, hey, we're doing ads ads, but they haven't given any of the type of details or definitions to like how, how they're working with ads as much as Peacock has. So I think that there's some difference there, but overall this happened pretty quickly. And I think that, um, that there was a big backlash on like Twitter and Reddit about them not a failing coming to a deal. And then the next day they're able to come to a deal. It was overall pretty, pretty crazy and unheard of. Hopefully this, this leads the window of HBO Max potentially coming onto the platform because, of Roku and, you know, Amazon Fire because, you know, I'm very, 
upset about HBO Max still not being there on, on Roku yet. Getting to the 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 implications that this could mean for HBO Max, so there's a couple things. One, if the holdup which we all believed was ad revenue from the streaming services and the content that's available. If that's the holdup, and that's what seemingly is the holdup between not only Roku, but also Amazon for HBO Max, if there is a way to for Roku to kind of, I wouldn't say cave, because it's not really caving, because they're still benefiting, everybody's still benefiting from this one way or the other. If there's a way for everyone to benefit, and that means HBO Max, specifically Warner Media, just needs to figure out some way of like licensing some content that's maybe not as popular that they don't have on HBO Max to Roku or Amazon in order for them to you you know in order for them to have the ability to have content that might be it I mean it really seems it was it was kind of crazy when it was announced that IMDb TV was getting lost because that's a pretty big series from ABC Studios and it didn't make a lot of sense and the only thing I could think of is that was just part of those you know part of those ongoing deals between the existing streaming services to ensure that their service ended up somewhere else. You would think that Lost would have ended up on Hulu because Hulu's owned by Disney. Why wouldn't a a, a program that has distribution rights through Disney end up on a Disney-owned service? But it didn't. So I'm wondering if that's ultimately what needs to happen is just there needs to be some content that ends ends up getting licensed to them so they have content for their own individual Roku channel or or IMDb TV, their free version of content that they can make ads exclusively on because I think that's what it's coming down to if they can't make money if Amazon and Roku can't make money off the app that itself because the ad space is sold outside of the realm of what's happening within those devices and that technology then the only way that they can make money off of it is by having content that is licensed to them so that they can have it on their own individual platforms like IMDb TV and like the Roku channel so that they can put their own ads on it. And then that's the, that's where they get the split. And then maybe the split is a little bit higher in favor for Roku and Amazon instead of the, the person who owns the content, who's licensing it to them. And in turn, they can then have their app on the platform itself. But I will say that it is extremely likely because of this deal that something will happen with Roku and Roku will continue to propel forward and Amazon will just have to be kind of picking up what's left after after uh, these deals come in place because I feel like now it's only a matter of time before HBO Max and Roku make a deal and it could be as soon as the next couple of weeks at the, at the rate that this is happening because if a deal like this can happen as quickly as it did and and if, and I say that quickly we heard rumblings Thursday by Monday the service is on the on Roku that's pretty quick that's you know a 5 day turnaround for it not being there, it being rumored to be there, and then it being on there. I mean, that's that's pretty quick. So, and it's not to say that, of course, that Peacock didn't already have a Roku version of the app available to immediately plug in, because they already have other services that are on Roku. So they know the the platform itself. They can put the the device on there. Same thing with HBO Max. They already have other other platform, other streaming services, and other apps on Roku and Amazon. So they can ha- they have the ability to make sure that it's available on there. But I think that's that's what it's going to come down to. All right. So jumping over to niche streaming services, Discovery CEO has compared their upcoming service to Disney Plus, and I say that I really wanted to make this this lead in just scathing because I swear to you, every single time the CEO talks about Discovery, they keep talking about how it's going to be this amazing thing. Thing. They're going to have this global rollout. It's going to be amazing. How long has he been saying this now? He's been saying this for like I swear it's been over a year. It was before yeah. we started the podcast. He's he was. He's been, I remember been talking- you making a comment because we discussed them like a, a few months ago, and you made the same comment of like they've been promising this service and how big and best it's going to be, and yet um, it, there's nothing for it quite right. yet except they more press have, releases. Yeah. <laughs> They never have a release date. They never have a price. They never have what type or, you know, which content's going to be, that we're going to be coming out. Meanwhile, they have just a quick thing. So they have, a, they had a series called Fixer Upper, I believe it was called, on, on, uh, HGTV. The, there was a, there was a, a, a family that did the show. 
they ended up being like they're propelled into success and their contract was coming up and part of the big thing for them to stick around was they were creating a network specifically featuring content that they picked themselves as well as continuing their show on this new network. That network was also supposed to have its own streaming service which was supposed to launch this year. They said it got pushed back because of COVID till 2021 but the issue is they keep talking about that as if it's not going to be part of this larger streaming service that Discovery is even though Discovery owns all of this stuff. My problem with this discussion Discovery one is that, okay, so to be fair, the reason why he said he compares it to Disney Plus is because unlike so many other streaming services that are out there, the parent companies, they own a lot of their content, but then they also license content to other people. Discovery doesn't license their content. They have their content everywhere. Discovery and Discovery Channels are all over the world and they have the content available in multiple international markets already when they bring their product to stream the streaming market they will have the ability to have all of their content in one place which is great and that is very close to what Disney had when Disney Plus launched however i still think that instead of getting up and saying we're launching this awesome service it's going to be awesome we're going to be you know we have the ability to be like Disney Plus instead of saying stuff like that maybe give us a price maybe give us a, a at least the time frame, a more realistic time frame, because saying 2021, I mean, that's pretty broad by itself. They're not saying, they're, they're not giving any sort of details. They're not saying what's going to be included, what won't be included. He just says the exact same things. And it just, it annoys the absolute crap out of me that somebody as big as Discovery can continue to sit here and tout a service, but not give any information whatsoever about the actual service. I, I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, he's been saying this for a while now, and there hasn't really been anything about it. And also just like the category of like trying to compare yourself from, from Disney to Discovery. Uh, there's there's a lot of like content that people will watch. I mean, I watch a lot of like Food Network shows or HGTV. My wife does, um, but it, it's it's a little. Um, it's not like The Mandalorian. It's not going to take over the internet. Like you might have a fad of something from like Fixer Up or whatnot, but it's not going to blow up like The Mandalorian or like Star Wars or the Marvel properties. It's just not. So I think it's just the, the fundamental premise of trying to compare yourself to one of like you know, if <laughs> Disney just doesn't even make sense. So. All right, and then finally with the niche streaming services, DC Universe is getting out of the streaming media business. Now, there's not a lot to talk about other than everything that Tony and I have been saying for probably the last eight to 12 months is exactly what's happening. DC Called Universe, it. yeah, exactly. DC Universe is, all of their scripted originals are porting over to HBO Max. The, the, the press release also stated a lot of the classic library shows that were on DC Universe will also be coming over to HBO Max. We literally talked about this a month ago and said that this is exactly what needs to happen. And it's good for HBO Max. This is a good thing for HBO Max, which is what their focus should be. DC Universe isn't necessarily going over anywhere. It's, it's turning into DC Universe Infinite, which is going to be a common Comics only streaming platform where you can read a number of comics. The community aspect will still stay. Literally exactly what Tony and I have been saying four months needed to happen and it is now happened. And I believe it's rolling out into the comics only streaming service in January. But the content, the new originals, there won't be any more new originals on the service going forward. They're all going to be landing over at HBO Max, which makes sense because at the rate that the new content was coming to DC Universe, they can't sustain. You you know, they were at one point having a, a new episode premiere every single week for a very long period of time. And then it got to the point where they didn't have as many originals to even do that, even though their intent initially when they launched was to expand to two episodes per week. And it just didn't work. I'm not saying it failed because I think a lot of it was to, you know, make a place for people who are huge DC fans to come and be able to be part of a community. And it did a good job of that. And that aspect isn't leaving. I think there's a lot of people who will still find value in the mass of comics library that is that is available there and those of us who are HBO Max subscribers like myself it's a huge plus because as we've already seen some of the content has already been coming over at Harley Quinn which has been a very popular series that's coming that came over to HBO Max last month Doom Patrol which was originally on DC Universe the second season premiered on HBO Max and they're getting new seasons Doom Patrol's getting another season Harley Quinn's getting another season all on HBO Max so it's good for everyone except for the people who didn't 
didn't care about the media in the, or who only cared about the media on DC Universe and now will unfortunately have to pay more. But there is a catch and the catch is that if you are an existing subscriber to DC Universe, there is an option for you to upgrade to HBO Max for a super discounted rate for the time being. All right. So with that being said, we're going to jump into two discussion points. I want to quickly talk about something that was popped up. So we did we talked about Mulan and how it probably didn't do as well as everyone would have hoped and there was a lot of contrasting numbers there were some potential numbers that were floating out there saying that Disney somehow raised almost 250 to 300 million dollars off the off Mulan on Disney Plus which was an insane number that I don't think a lot of analysts believed but it was being touted as if it was entirely possible but what do you know the entertainment strategy guy, he's back and he has some definitive, not so definitive, but definitive numbers as far as we're concerned until Disney actually clarifies things probably next next month at their investor call. But uh, 1.2 million people probably bought Mulan, which means that translates to just about $35 million on the high end of what they potentially made for Mulan on Disney+, Plus, which is obviously nowhere near the amount of money that they would have made. We've talked about this before. The price point was probably a bit too high. It also doesn't help that the movie itself didn't garner as much praise as some of their other films in the past. It is important to keep in mind that Disney did say that this was an experiment. They were trying to figure out if this does work, if it might not work. There was also a report earlier this week saying that the next Pixar film, which is called Soul, which is supposed to be releasing around Thanksgiving, could potentially be coming to Disney Plus in a similar fashion. They haven't announced anything officially. There's one thing for sure. If Mulan only made about $30 million, it's very extremely unlikely that Black Widow will be coming to Disney Plus in this format. It will be, I'm sure, coming in a normal format to theaters whenever it can. But for now, I would, if you're waiting for Black Widow to end up on Disney Plus, it's very unlikely that's going to happen. I agree. Um, I feel like overall these numbers, these best estimates, um, I've actually uh, personally, I feel like they've done better than actually what I was expecting. I felt that there were surprisingly more people who did check on Mulan and did pay the thirty dollars at least to the United States. That was kind of surprising and it can show that there is there is some type of appetite for a for a paid video on demand sort of release like this. I think Mulan itself, unfortunately, yes, at uh, the high price point, you're already paying on top of the six ninety nine a month for Disney Plus. Or five ninety nine, no six ninety nine a month for Disney Plus. You're already paying that on top of this thirty dollar exclusive tier access, and then there's a bunch of the movie wasn't really necessarily true to the animated movie, and that upset a lot of people. There was some controversy with um, the actors and actresses, um, and some of the statements that they made publicly. There's been some other types of criticisms that have been there with Disney as a whole uh, participating and working with China. So it's just. I feel like with the age of social media and, and how important it is for movies to have a positive review um, to get forward, I felt that this was was a decent success. It showed the viability that there, the pay on demand can be a, a viable opportunity for these studios during a COVID-related time. I don't think that this is the future of business. This is not the future of big budget movies. It's not going to be released like this. I think this was a special time for a special era of movie watching. I think for maybe something like Tenant, this movie probably could could have gotten, gotten a lot more praise because one, it's a newer property. Two, um, Christopher Nolan's got a, a very strong following, and a lot of his movies don't really fail. And that there wasn't really any true, either real or pseudo or whatever type of controversy you want with with Tenet. It's just a movie about people shooting people in weird time stuff. So um, I feel like a movie like that probably would have done even better on paid video on demand than in Mulan did. But overall, I was pretty surprised. And as long as Disney can recoup the, the operating costs, you know, the budget for the film, then plus marketing expenses, then uh, Disney's going to be happy. It's not, it didn't reach their goals. Uh, it didn't reach like pre-COVID goals. Obviously, it's not going to be the case. But as long as they can break even on this, that's that's the win. That's the win here. And so it, it can at least show that in special times that there is an appetite for paid video on demand. But it, it isn't going to probably turn much more than a, a, a little more than a profit. It's, it's not going to reap in like these huge, these huge profits like the Lion King or some other property that they did recently. Yeah. And just to put in perspective, I will say to be fair, the Mulan on Disney plus that was available in multiple markets, not just here in the United States and domestically tenant made is up to about $36 million at this exact moment internationally, or I should say worldwide, it's up to $239 million. And I don't think Mulan is even close 
trying to see if I could pull up numbers for Mulan's uh, outside of the United States. It says worldwide it's only up to 57. So it's made $57 million outside of the United States because of anywhere outside of the United States has made $57 million in the markets that it can be shown. Um, that would be specifically China and other markets don't have Disney Plus. But even if you had Disney Plus and they made $30 million and you have $57 million from there, they might break $120 million when it's all said and done. Um, but I can't see, I mean, like obviously Tenet did much better in terms of box office, just because of how much money Tenet's bringing in in other markets outside of the United States as well. Because while they might be right on par, if you are just looking at Mulan's numbers from a domestic point of view, they're not because that 1.2 is, is worldwide. So definitely worth mentioning. Also, I wanted to, I, I included this tweet because I think it was a very good thing to ponder for anybody out there who's thinking about the Disney experiment with Mulan or Warner Brothers releasing Tenet in theaters. Brendan Brady, who we've talked about before with some of his tweets, he said, what stops Disney, Warner Media, Paramount, NBC Universal from banding together to reject theatrical exclusivity altogether? Day and date on all films, theatrical, pay one PVOD and SVOD tier to get a full year of new releases, ad subs, lower churn. Theaters that add value survive. And I have to say that's exactly true because the reality of it is that if there was a tier that you could pay for that was a little bit higher price for streaming services, but you were guaranteed to get all of that studio's releases for the entire year on that streaming device, I think there would be a lot more people who would be more inclined because the problem is that theaters in general have gotten more pricey over the years in general and a lot of people complain about that and the studios have been trying to figure out ways of making more money off the box office, but if you have uh, somebody who, let's say HBO Max costs $15 a month for $25 a month, you are guaranteed every Warner Media film that releases, but you keep some subscribing and you keep subscribing and you keep subscribing instead of $15 a month there you're paying $25 a month every single you know throughout the entire year that's a lot more money that's in Warner Media's pocket and more people will take that approach rather than going to see the occasional movie in the theater that's going to cost them more than $10 to begin with so that's a good idea that I thought was worth bringing up all right finally the Emmy list so as we talked about net before, Netflix had an insane amount of nominations, but it ended up being HBO who walked away with more uh, more awards than anybody else. And that was probably quite a surprise for a lot of people because ultimately it came down to the fact that uh, HBO just had better stuff that ultimately could win. Nominations aren't everything, but streaming as a whole, if you include HBO, into that because of all of the HBO content now being available on HBO Max. If you include all of that, there is a lot of streaming services out there that won a lot of a lot of awards. Some of them didn't win much. Quibi actually ended up walking away with a couple themselves. Apple TV Plus got some. Disney Plus ended up walking away with a good chunk of, of awards. HBO walked away with the most, and Netflix walked away with a significant number too. But needless to say, streaming as an overall overall statement, the streaming services are. Pr- are doing very, very well when it comes to high quality content. And that's really what makes a big difference. All right. So with all of that being said, that is going to round out this episode of the podcast. Be sure to check out all the trailers that uh, came out in the last week while you are looking at the show notes, which are found at the streamingwars.io. You can also follow us on Twitter and join our discord for all these articles that we talk about here on the podcast and some that we don't. You can follow us on Instagram for all these announcements related to new episodes of the podcast releasing. You can send us an email at the streaming wars at gmail.com with any questions comments concerns or feedback or topics you'd like us to discuss on future episodes and then wherever you are listening to this podcast please leave us feedback that is always greatly appreciated wherever you are listening to this and uh, just as a final note we have been going strong where we pr- have been producing an episode every single week for quite some time unfortunately next week we will not have an episode uh, i know the last time we didn't have an episode i didn't give enough notice so i want to make sure that we told everybody ahead of time the last time we didn't have an episode was back in june we're just going to take the next week off so we will be back in two weeks with all the news and discussion points from the next two weeks while that is happening we will still continue to post articles on our discord and twitter for you guys to keep up with the news and we will be back in two weeks with a brand new episode of the streaming wars so with all of that being said for tony and myself this has been the streaming wars and we'll see you guys next time thanks for listening to the streaming wars Check us out on Twitter and Instagram. Also consider supporting us on Patreon. Links can be found at thestreaminghorse.io.